Hello and welcome to another free episode of Statistically Insignificant, a statistical sedative in audio and visual format. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm standing in front of a board full of numbers and flow diagrams pointing at different parts of it with a long stick. Desperately try to keep his eyes open in the single chair in the room, it's Bart. How's it going, Bart? Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and yeah, I'm uh, very stuck in the chair. <laughs> I would leave, but like, I can't get up. I mean, that's what the straps are for. <laughs> and, and the little things propping your eyes open too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would have preferred if there was some classical music playing if I'm going to have that experience. No, that would interrupt things. <laughs> Today we'll be doing the first episode about whether and how a person can build an expectation for what they are likely to experience based on the kind of population level statistics which are typical output of any given data analysis. This has come up before, particularly in our discussion of medical stuff, because this is where somebody who's had no exposure to statistics is most likely to wind up making decisions about their healthcare and things or somebody else's healthcare based on stats. We've got another example of that to do a bit of an in-depth case study where we'll be looking at IVF its success rates, which comes with a content warning for that bit for discussion of child loss, infertility and the like. First though, we need to talk about the relationship between population statistics and populations and individuals within those populations. This has some key aspects, variation, outliers or extreme values and covariates. So first up is variation. We've discussed this a bit before in our episode on summary statistics, for example, when we said that a statistic that gives the average of something for a population is on its own not particularly useful, because you have no way of knowing how much variation there is around that central tendency. So if we have some statistic value on this x-axis, we'll pretend that's a straight line. Let's say here is your mean, and you have one distribution that looks like this, and you have another distribution that looks like this, the first one here, this peaked stuff that's more clustered around that sort of mean behavior, has less variation. You are more likely to see something close to the mean in that case than in this more spread out distribution situation. These have the same center, the same mean, but different levels of variation. Go see our discussion on summary statistics for more detail on that. Surely it would be unlikely that it would be so like neatly arranged around the mean, you know? It depends on what you're looking at. Like, this is very sort of general, but certainly you, if you have enough of a sample, you can get distributions that look like this. Right. Now I need to use the words outlier and extreme value. These are pretty loaded terms. Both of them basically mean some observation that is a long way from the bulk of the population. Outlier is the more technical in some ways because we have various definitions for what makes something an outlier based on measurable distance for the population, while extreme value is less likely to have a threshold associated with it and is more kind of a vibes-based general term for something that looks unusual. So extreme value is not when you get like massive discounts at the supermarket? <laughs> Depends on how big of a discount it is. <laughs> Both of these rely on the ability to measure distance, which means that we have to have something that behaves like a number with not just ordering, but the ability to say that two things have the same or different distance between them. Definitions of outliers are often used to identify points that are possible errors. For example, if you have data of tree height, you know that a tree listed as a kilometre tall isn't going to actually exist because trees just don't grow that big. We'll have a whole episode on outliers at some point in time, but for now I'm going to give you one example of how they can be defined by a threshold that gets built from what we call quartiles and the interquartile range. Quartiles are values within a data set that correspond to quarters of the data. So your first quartile is the value with 25% or the first quarter of the data below. Second has value with 50% of data below. Third quartile has 75% of data below it. So if we have, uh, let's make up some numbers here, 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11. There's eight observations here, 25% of that is 2. So the first quartile is going to be in between these two. The second quartile is going to have four observations smaller than it, so it's going to go here. And the third quartile is going to have 75% or three quarters, which is six, which is going to go there. There's a bunch of different ways to actually calculate these thresholds, but let's just say we're going to go halfway between one and two. So you'd have 1.5 as the first quartile, halfway between four and five is 4.5, and halfway between seven and nine is eight. 
So these are your quartiles in this context. Does that trans? Is there like third tile or whatever for like thirds? In, but yeah, in, yeah, exactly. yeah. So you can quantile as opposed to quartile is you pick the percentage. Right. So like a 10% quantile has 10% of the data below it. Yeah. Quartiles are just pretty typical because we use the median, like the central measure, which has half on each side as a measure of center, basically. Yeah. The interquartile range or IQR is the third quartile, which is Q3, minus the first quartile, which is Q1, uh, three minus Q1. So it is the distance between the 75% and the 25%. So it encompasses the central 50% of the data. So in this case, this would be eight minus 1.5, which would give you 6.5. Mm-hmm. Look, I can do arithmetic in my head. <laughs> Yay. So our outlier definition is uh, Q1 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range, or Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. So what you're basically saying is, well, I'm going to look at the 25% boundary and go below that by more than my interquartile range, so more than the range of the central 50%. And I'm going to go to the 75% boundary and go 1.5 times that central 50% range above that threshold. Mm -hmm. This definition is pretty general because it doesn't care about the shape of your distribution, though with very asymmetric ones, it can be inclined to tag the longer end value. So if your distribution looks something like this, chances are this will be like the central sort of 50% of your data will be in here. Yeah. So that 1.5 times that would be about here. Yeah. Right. And all of this stuff would be classified as outliers. There are other outlier definitions which do make some other assumptions. This one's pretty straightforward uh, because it doesn't rely on any sort of structural information other than that you basically have an ordering of some kind and hopefully can measure some idea of distance. If you have other assumptions, like let's say you assume that your population is normally distributed. So uh, this is what the bell curve looks like for those of you who don't know what a normal distribution is. And I am pretty bad at drawing them, but that's all right. So if we have the mean here, then one way of defining outliers based on this distribution is you take some threshold here, where you've got 2.5% of the distribution up there, and the same threshold on this side, where you have 2.5% that way. And it's 2.5% of the probability, not of the possible values, because we consider this to be like an infinite in both directions. Right. This is kind of the err example for population statistics, because it's very common to assume that something you're measuring is normally distributed, or approximately normally distributed. While the interquartile range definition may or may not actually identify any points, I mean, if you just don't have anything outside this range, then you don't have any outliers, right? This definition, based on the top and bottom, like 2.5%, gives you the most extreme 5%. That is more likely to be seen. So you are actually saying, we have some observations in these extremes, we're going to call those outliers. That can be a bit problematic, let's say, because if you take the top and bottom 2.5% of your true population, right, let's say of 7 billion people, 8 billion people on the planet, Mm -hmm. that extreme 5% is about 400 million people. Yeah. That's a few who are classified as outliers in this sort of context. One of the issues with these ideas about extreme values or outlier values is that they really do exist. They really do happen. And if you wind up being an outlier on something, that's not unexpected to see in a true population. Ideas around sort of variance and how much you've got of a population that it would be classified as outliers can help to inform your ideas of, well, not only how much do I expect deviation from that sort of central tendency, but if I don't have any other information, what's my chance of being, quote, a long way from that central tendency? Yeah. This is also with respect to just one variable. As you add more, the chances that a given person will be defined as an outlier for something grows. This matters when it comes to relating population statistics to your expectations in the sense that knowing like mean and variance, your own outcome for something can still be really unusual from a population statistics perspective. 
When we start looking at more than one variable, we also get relationships between them. This can actually be useful for the individual because you may be able to tie your expectations to how your experience and demographics relate to whatever you're looking at. This is what we call covariate structure. Co meaning more than one, two specifically, variate, variation. So this is things that vary together. Because we're talking about personal experience, we're going to talk about stuff related to demographics and physiology, and we'll see a bunch of that in our AVF example. But social structure, geopolitical, geographical, whatever, these all come into play with respect to how you experience the world and what your expectations about that experience might look like. For example, your experience of healthcare outcomes is strongly tied to where you live, whether or not you're particularly wealthy, whether you are disabled, have chronic health conditions, your gender, and your race. A rich white 35-year-old dude living in the US is going to get the best care in the world, but is also less likely to need it than somebody living in poverty in a remote indigenous community in Australia, or the slums and scrapyards of Mumbai or something. So these material conditions really do come into play with res like this kind of interlocking way with respect to that experience. So if you're trying to refine your own expectations based on available data, you can look to these, which is probably not going to tell you anything surprising if you know you're a member of a marginalized group. I hope, though, that this sort of info does empower people to push for better things when they see just how stratified some of these experiences are, even within a rich country like Australia, that theoretically has baseline universal access to healthcare. Of course, the issue is whether or not that info is actually available. For one, it may simply not exist in the sense that a lot of research in medicine particularly excludes a lot of potential participants if they are expected to have more variable responses or other risk factors. We talked about this in our episode, very first episode, about pregnancy risk yeah. and other things where there are thresholds for body size, for example, where hormonal contraceptives, gee, it took me a little bit to get that one, <laughs> just don't work because the dose isn't high enough because the research was not done with people who have large bodies. Ironically enough, uh, one of the ways that this shows up is that if you're using rat models for your early experiments on drugs or whatever, a lot of those tests just exclude female rats because their responses are just too variable. They're not reliable as test subjects. You'd be amazed how many drugs have come to market with few instances of like women. I don't. I don't like the term biologically female, so let's go with AFAB <laughs> uh, people being in the like test subjects for this research. Didn't it come out a few years ago that lots of rat tests were off because they didn't realize that rats responded with stressful reactions to male researchers in the room? <laughs> I mean, that would not surprise me, but. Yeah, I mean, all this sort of stuff happens. Like, I'm no expert. I'm just, like, half remembering something I saw online. But, like... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, all this sort of stuff makes research really, really hard, and accounting for it is difficult. Uh, sometimes you will add, like, a, a covariate in your data, which represents who did the particular tests. So you can kind of control for that to some extent, but it makes everything harder and messier every time. Info about this sort of covariate structure is most commonly used to argue about population level inequality because it's evidence of systemic discrimination against marginalized groups. But if you're someone more at risk as a result of being in a marginalized group, you can use it to arm yourself as well. This is why the relationship between chronic illnesses of various forms are so important and grossly understudied, as well as the interaction between chronic illness, disability, and other complications in medicine. Okay, now it's time for our extended CAFE study. In vitro fertilization, IVF, is one way that people who have trouble conceiving or carrying a pregnancy to term can approach the issue. For the linguistically curious, who have seen these terms floating around, the Latin in vitro, as opposed to in vivo, refers to a process happening outside of a body. In our case, fertilization, but you can also have in vitro or in vivo drug tests and the like. We're going to use IVF as an in-depth investigation of how these statistics are used to manage expectations of patients and how the numbers that matter to a healthcare provider in the form of a fertility clinic may be different to the things that the patient expects to know about. How would you do a out-of-body drug test? So you put a cell culture in like a little petri dish or something, you put the drug into the cell culture. Yeah, fair. Yeah, so that's distinct from injecting somebody or having them take the drug. Yeah. 
As part of the research for this, I spoke to a friend about her experience stepping into this space to get a feel for what patients get told and how they encounter the statistical information, and went through a handful of IVF clinic websites to see what information they give the public, then in some broader sort of industry-level material. There's a bunch of references in the notes below, I encourage you to go and have a look. So the IVF procedure is usually thought of in cycles, which occur like this. So you start off with like ovary stimulation, which can be done with like drugs and things like that. This isn't always done, but the idea is that in a typical like menstrual or ovary cycle, you'll produce one egg. Whereas with the IVF, you want to produce a whole lot of eggs in order to have more viable things that you can implant later. Ovary stimulation is intended to get your ovary to produce more eggs for a given cycle. How is that done? Drugs, primarily. Uh, right. They have side effects, which is why it's not always done. So it's really like a risk analysis of do you want to try this to have a better shot at success on a given cycle versus do you want to tolerate the side effects? Yeah. From there, we go to egg retrieval, which is when eggs are like extracted from the ovary. I don't know what the specific timing is because like the process is quite complicated, but they're when the eggs are sufficiently developed in the ovary when they would be inclined to otherwise be released for fertilization, your clinic will go in, extract the eggs as many as possible, and then from there those viable eggs, they are often tested for viability, are fertilized and tested in a lab then they are cultured in order to like see what develops. Is the retrieval done surgically? Yeah. Yeah. Once you have a fertilized egg and it's been cultured for like a couple of days, exactly the timing varies and there are a whole bunch of different methods. Some may be frozen or they go to the next step fresh. I will note here that what gets referred to as a complete egg retrieval cycle means that all of the embryos that come from a single retrieval have been used. We'll come back to that idea later. So from here, you have the uh, viable embryos are placed into the uterus, which is called a transfer. You might do just one at a time, you might do multiple depending on the circumstances. If you put multiple of these like fertilized eggs have had a few days to develop sort of some cell division, if you put more than one of them in the uterus you increase the risk of having a multiple pregnancy, that means twins, triplets, whatever. There are risks associated with having a multiple pregnancy, so usually the aim is to have just a singleton, so just one fetus with a given pregnancy, but you don't always have a lot of control onto that. Aren't twins quite common from uh, IVF? Ah, uh, we will see some numbers related to that. <laughs> I don't remember them off the top of my head. But uh, certainly single uh, single births are the most common. Yeah. I don't know whether twins are more common for IVF than otherwise. Right. Okay, from there, you have a pregnancy test, which is usually like a couple of weeks in. And then at the eight-week mark, I'm running out of space here, the implanted embryo is tested to see if it is properly implanted in the uterus lining, and this is what indicates that a, a clinical pregnancy has been uh, established. We call this a clinical pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of last stage is that this goes to a live birth. And here we get to, unfortunately, the discussion of child loss and things. Because this eight-week mark does not mean that if you have a pregnancy that has become established and been defined as a clinical pregnancy, you are not guaranteed to have a live birth because miscarriages still happen. Yeah. This is one of the things that we'll get to in more detail here about what does success mean because this bit is what the IVF clinic does. Yeah. And then they kind of pass the patient off to the obstetrician. Mm-hmm or gynecologist or whatever, for the actual care during pregnancy. To a clinic, the clinical pregnancy stage is kind of the end of what they do. Yeah. So one of the ideas of what success looks like is a clinical pregnancy rate, which is distinct from the live birth rate. And that's what we're going to go to in detail now. We have first clinical pregnancy and live birth. A clinical pregnancy is what the clinic sees as kind of the, the end state for them. But for the patient, of course, who's there to have a baby, a live birth is what they are really looking for. So there's somewhat of a conflict here. And one of the, I think, the foremost misunderstandings about IVF is when you see success rates quoted, it may or may not be clear what that success is actually defined to be. Yeah. Broadly, whatever your idea of success is, it's usually given as a percentage. So this is a rate per hundred. Pregnancy success rate is measuring the pregnancies that are successfully implanted. 
while live birth rate is how many pregnancies go to term and result in a live birth, that is, not a stillborn child. Yeah. If you have twins or triplets, that still counts as a single pregnancy, it's just multiple births within the pregnancy. Unfortunately, there are complications to both of these because you have both the outcome, pregnancy and birth, and what you count as your start point. That might be the number of cycles started, so that is all the way back here, yeah. or the number of implantations, which is here. And, and these will give you different numbers because somebody may start a cycle and then not get any viable eggs to be implanted, or if they have had, say, three or four viable eggs from a given retrieval, then you could have three or four implantations and each of those would have a success or failure. Or well, if the first one's successful to a live birth, then presumably you're not going to do the rest immediately, right? But these these numbers matter. So what you are counting from and what you are counting to will both affect the sort of statistics that you get out. So let's have a look at some actual definitions here. So this comes from the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology, which I think is a, a bunch in the US. And here are some of the actual percentages that they give you. The number of cycle starts, that is your kind of cycle started thing up here. Is this an independent group or is it an industry It's an industry body, yeah. But they are reporting raw numbers. Right. So there is some, it, it's quite transparent and very accountable. This is just there as the numbers and the percentages calculated from the numbers. Right. They don't give all of the detail I would like, but that's because I'm a fucking nerd, right? And this <laughs> so this is your very early stage. This number of retrievals, that's how many times you've actually gone in and collected eggs. This is your egg collection. And these are the implantations. Okay, so these percentages underneath each of these correspond to what percentage of these number of cycle starts, in this first case, led to a positive pregnancy test, what percentage led to a clinical pregnancy, what percentage of cycle starts saw a miscarriage. Yep. In the second one, you start with the number of retrievals, and then you have a live birth per retrieval. So that could be more than one, right? Because theoretically, if you got, say, six eggs from each retrieval and you had at least one live birth, maybe somebody stored their eggs and came back and have an had another child in the future, right? Yeah. That could be more than one. It's not, but hypothetically you could. This live birth per retrieval is based on the egg collection stage. Again, we have the positive pregnancy test and the clinical pregnancies. These are different because your body can basically start producing the chemicals that show up on a pregnancy on a, on a piss test, right, for pregnancy, while the early stages of the embryo are not quite properly embedded. So they're there, the body has started responding to it, but it hasn't started actually developing the kind of connection to the tissue on the uterus wall. Yeah. So that's why those two are not necessarily the same. The number of transfers is kind of the number of attempts to start a pregnancy. So this is, I think, a particularly useful statistic for people to go and look at because this is kind of the, the pregnancy start point for a lot of people as opposed to the egg retrieval and things which are kind of pre-pregnancy because the, the step between egg retrieval and implantation happens outside of the body. Yep. So you have live births, positive pregnancy rate, clinical pregnancies, and the implantation rate. So this is the rate at which a fertilized egg which has been transferred to the uterus actually properly implants in the uterus wall. Okay. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> As a further complications, we're talking about success per cycle, per transfer, whatever. This is not the same as success per patient. Because there are kind of two ways that a patient ends IVF treatment. They have a baby or they stop attempting. That means these per cycle statistics aren't the whole story, as there are some patients who will have a baby after the first cycle, others who go through cycle after cycle after cycle and never have a baby, and then just wind up going, I can't do this anymore, and stop trying. I don't like necessarily like the t phrase stop trying because it implies that you kind of give up on something, and, and you do, but like, it's not like you're putting down something because you're bad at it, right? You're putting down something because it's a really harrowing experience. It's expensive and it's hard and it's quite often quite traumatic. Yeah, absolutely. 
I, I just want to be clear that when I say stop trying, I am not saying that this is a failure on behalf of the people who do it. There's plenty of guilt that people experience around this and shame and all this sort of stuff. If, if I can, I don't want to increase that at the very least. Well, especially like as a price point, like you might only have one shot at this depending on your like income level and stuff. So like, oh yeah, absolutely. Stopping trying is like, seems like there's a, yeah. material conditions involved here. <laughs> It's funny how those keep showing up, huh? <laughs> Okay, so there's another set of statistics, which is success rates or live birth per new patient. This is based on that from the same people, so from SART again. And what we see here is the mean number of attempts at egg retrieval for patients achieving live birth. So what that means here is you have a patient, how many times do they have to initiate that egg retrieval step before they achieve live birth. And this excludes people who do not achieve live birth. People who try and try and try and never get there aren't included in this statistic. Mean number of transfers for patients achieving live birth, similar idea. Uh, this is the average number, but instead of looking at that very first sort of egg retrieval stage, I guess the second stage, which is the egg retrieval, this is counting from the point at which you have a fertilized egg transferred into the uterus. Yeah. Down here was the number of transfers was just, I was looking at 2019 data because it was the last set of data pre-pandemic, which did in fact change stuff because there were delays in care and all the rest of it. So the number of transfers were ju was just to count. Yeah. So that's how many occurred in 2019. Mean number of embryos transferred was on average how many embryos were transferred in a given transfer, right? And the implantation rate is per transfer what percentage of those actually had a successful implantation yeah. into the wall. My statistician paranoia is kicking in looking at this because I haven't been able to find a histogram or similar showing the distribution of the number of cycles to live birth. Yeah. The number of cycles attempted overall, which would include the people who never have a baby, or the typical number of cycles before a patient who hasn't had a baby stops. Yeah. This is really important because, as mentioned in this very episode, the central tendency, the mean in this case, is not always a great representation. We don't know the variance, we don't know how skewed the distribution is, we don't have a lot of other information that I think would be quite relevant when it comes to managing patient experience or expectations with this. Absolutely. One example, right, is that if we think of this as a number of attempts, and this is, number, I guess, number of patients, well, if we have one attempt here, we might have something like this. Two, there, three, there four, you know, and yeah. so on. If your mean number of attempts sits about here, right, slightly over one or something, that doesn't reflect the experience of all these people up here. Yes. And that's why I get a little bit tetchy, I suppose would be the best word for it, <laughs> when um, this sort of stuff is reported with just that central tendency. Yeah. What I have found that's kind of similar information is statistics on cumulative chance that come from an Australian industry site called yourivfsuccess.com.au. Mm -hmm. This is what that looks like. This comes from a kind of outcome estimation form where you can enter some information about your circumstances and it will give you a prediction for your potential success. The stats that it gives are things like chance of having a baby with a complete egg retrieval cycle. Here, this means all of the fertilized eggs, all the embryos from an egg retrieval cycle have been used, right? So it's not just one implantation necessarily. Yeah. This is the sort of provided estimates for a couple where both people are 30, there have been no previous pregnancies or IVF cycles, and the primary infertility diagnosis was endometriosis. Those are the sorts of details that they ask you for, mm -hmm. because those are the sorts of things that are relevant to this sort of process. This is calculated from these. These are the probability of having a baby from each complete egg retrieval cycle. This is the first one, this is the second one, this is the third one. You'll notice that the probability of having a baby decreases yeah. with each cycle. You can see this here in the sense that it goes from 45 to 66 to 77. That jumps less each time. Yeah. And I'll show you how this is actually calculated. So your cycle, uh, we're looking at one, two, and three. The probability of having a baby on your first cycle is 0 0.45, 45%. The second one, 0 0.38, and on a third, 0 0.32. Cumulative, for the cumulative on the first one, you've only done the first one, so that's got to be 0 0.45. 
cumulative for the second one includes the probability of succeeding on the first one, so we're going to have 0 0.45, plus the probability of failing on the first one but succeeding on the second one. Yep. The probability of failing on the first one is going to be 1 minus 0 0.45, because 0 0.45 is the probability of success, it's a binary option, 1 minus 0 0.45 is the probability of a failure, uh, and that's going to be times the probability of success on the second one, yeah. 3, 8. So this winds up being 0 0.45 plus 0 0.209, we round to two decimal places and we get 0 0.66, which is that 66% on the second egg retrieval cycle. The number of the beast. <laughs> almost, almost. <laughs> Doesn't quite round that way. Third one, same idea, except we start with the 0 0.66, mm -hmm. and we add 1 minus the probability of success, which is the probability of failure, so 1 minus 0 0.38, times the probability of success of the third one, 0 0.32, which winds up being, I'm going to put a column down there, uh, 0 0.66 plus 0 0.11, which is your 0 0.7. Seven. Mm -hmm. It is important to say that unlike other things where we have assumed that each cycle is independent and has the same probability of success, like think when we were talking about pregnancy or contraceptive failure rates and things, we don't assume that here. The probability of having a baby declines with each successive cycle. There is this kind of relationship between which cycle you're at and your probability of success, so we're not assuming independence here. Part of the reason for this is that if you succeed on the first one, you're probably not going to go on to the second. And if you did not succeed on the first one, you may have an overall lower chance of success for whatever reason for IVF in general. Yeah. The higher the number of attempts that you require, chances are the lower your probability of success in each individual one. Yeah. This is also why it's important to remember that these probabilities include people who succeeded before the later ones. I wanted to ask, is there a relationship between IVF and miscarriage? Because we like obviously established earlier about the gap between uh, live birth and... Yeah, so I don't actually know. Miscarriages can be kind of hard to count because there's a lot of unassisted pregnancies that occur and then, mis then fail or miscarry before the person even knows that they're pregnant. Yeah. So we don't necessarily know what the quote-unquote true miscarriage rate is for unassisted situations. Yeah. Also, there's a lot of efforts to select for viable embryos to be implanted that are less likely to fail. Yeah. Well, you would do that if you're trying to get somebody pregnant, right? So it's it's not like a, a straightforward comparison. Yeah. Those if you go and have a look on the SART and you go and look at this miscarriage rate or you can find statistics around the difference between a clinical pregnancy and a live birth. So those yeah. would be your miscarriages here are uh, what you would look at to work those that detail out and then you would go and compare that to a typical miscarriage rate among unassisted pregnancies, which I think is about 25%. Right. But again, that's biased by situations where the person doesn't know they are pregnant and then doesn't know that they miscarry. No, I was just asking because like, uh, if we're making the distinction, it's worth uh, seeing if there is a relationship there. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the, these are all things that people going into this sort of stuff have to consider because one of the reasons, one of the forms of infertility that causes people to go and seek out help with you through IVF is basically that they keep miscarrying. Yeah. I mean, miscarriages can happen for a huge number of reasons, not necessarily related to the physiology of the gestational parent. Yeah. It can be related to problems in the, like, in the egg, in the fertilization process, so on. Yeah. One of the ways that IVF can be used to kind of skip that risk, depending on how the miscarriages are occurring, is that you filter for the embryos that are less likely to have that happen. Yeah. So they're already considered viable in a way that you can't check for if you're conceiving naturally. Looking at all this, uh, I can't imagine why it would be confusing for patients, <laughs> right? Because like, it's hard to explain this stuff, and I don't know how willing or able most doctors in a clinical setting are to really get down and do the maths and discuss it in detail. Like, a lot of these kind of industry websites are genuinely put out there with the intention of informing patients, but they can still be hard to read. 
and they can there's a couple of good videos on them but like the the variety of of numbers that are cited and you have to think about all these sort of overlapping definitions or where they don't overlap like when do you start measuring when do you stop measuring it's hard and i hope that if anybody watching this is thinking of doing ivf this is helpful for you uh, if this is not medical advice <laughs> <laughs> There's also a very real conflict of interest between patients and clinics. IVF is profitable. So if a patient is discouraged from starting because they perceive their chance of success, i.e. having a baby, is low, or they discontinue because they don't see early success and feel that their chance is kind of slipping away, the clinic doesn't get as much money. Selling hope kind of becomes the business model. This blew up a few years ago because clinics were seen to be misrepresenting the likelihood of success, whatever the metric the clinic was using, for the patient that meant having a baby, and people were spending tens of thousands of dollars on cycle after cycle, despite the fact that they were very unlikely to ever have the outcome that they want. Yeah. A lot of that misrepresentation comes down to the covariates, which is what we're going to talk about now. The most impactful covariates are age and the particular form of infertility. I'm going to talk in detail about age because it's easier and it's numerical, mm -hmm. but if you go to the SART website, you can also look at specific infertility diagnoses and see how they affect outcomes. That uh, Australian website, the My IVF thing, also gives you the option to select different diagnoses and like, people can have multiple overlapping ones as well. So that is a consideration. There is some information out there if you are in those conditions. All right, so let's have a look at age. Here is a chart showing the live births per intended egg retrieval. So this is right back at the start of that process, yep. looking to the live birth, which is kind of the end point for the patient. This is from SART. It's from 2019 data, again, pre-pandemic, so it doesn't have some of the impacts of delayed care here. We can see that we've got two things going on in kind of each age bracket, and we do have age brackets here because you're not looking at kind of individual years, you're looking at a range of years. We have the number of live births, so live birth rate per 100, and you have what kind of live births. So you have singleton, twins, triplets. I didn't see any data on more than triplets, I don't know how or where that was recorded. <laughs> and you also have information in this uh, second column per age bracket on whether you had pregnancies that were carried to term, pregnancies that happened pre-term, or very pre-term. Can't remember what the definition of these is, but I think that pre-term was like two weeks before the baby was strictly due, or might have been up to four, and I think very pre-term was any time before that. Yeah. So what we can see here is that age impacts the live birth rate. It drops pretty precipitously from above 50% if you're under 35, to, if I remember rightly, and we'll see it on the next slide, about 5% if you're over 42. Yep. As far as I could tell, um, there was no data for age groups above like 45-ish in anything I saw, and I don't think that many people above 45 actually succeed in, in having IVF. Yep. So you can see that there is this drop, and that is one of the strongest sort of relationships in IVF is between the age of the, of the gestational parent and the uh, success. Here are the raw numbers. So we can see that we have live births here. So these are singleton births, so you have a single baby. Live births are all live births. Mm -hmm. For under 35, it's 55%, drops to 4.3% 4, 4 if you're over 42. You've also got the statistics down here for term, preterm, and very preterm. What's preterm then, sir? Uh, so term is your full 40 weeks. I think preterm is like 36 to 40 weeks. Right. There may be like a two week buffer on that. I don't remember the specifics. Right. I will also note that these percentages, so this 55% is within this age cohort. So you have to look at this number in order to understand this one. Yeah. A confidence range here is something that we haven't really talked about. But this is basically giving you an estimate of uncertainty, a representation of what the data tells you would be a plausible actual number, because there's always errors in data, right? Yeah. Based on the actual observations here. So this confidence range around that 55% says 54.5 to 55.4. So it's, it's a little bit of margin of error. Like at some point, we're going to talk about these sort of confidence ranges and confidence intervals. It's a whole discussion in its own right. But my general, like intuition for these is it's saying you have your central estimate and then you have a plausible range. Yep. I will also say that notice the confidence range is only given for the live births. 
all of these statistics will have some amount of uncertainty associated with them because all statistics do, but there's only uncertainty represented for one of these. So you could think of this as a bit like a central tendency and a variation sort of metric. Well, it's also like the desired outcome. So it's the one that people, like, if you are interested in it, in doing the program, you would be... Yeah, well, if you are trying to use this to predict your own experience, this is what you would look to. I am using these kind of live birth percentages to inform what I expect to see, even though I'm not in this data, right? So I'm using a sample of the population, the people from 2019, to inform what I expect to see in 2022. Yeah. Or 23, depending on when this comes out. That's where you go from descriptive statistics about the population that was to predictive statistics using those descriptive metrics to ref to inform what you expect to see in the future. Absolutely. Here is another example. This comes from a particular IVF clinic in Australia. This is their 2020 data. So this will be impacted by COVID. Uh, and this is what they publish for patients. So notice that they have clinical pregnancy and live birth. So the difference between those would be your miscarriage, mm -hmm. effectively. So what this is saying is per fresh embryo transfer. So again, this first one was all embryo transfers from a given egg retrieval. Now we are looking at fresh embryo transfer. So this is the first embryo from an egg retrieval that has not been frozen. And that's kind of, that appears to make a difference as well, whether or not you have had a frozen embryo or just done it immediately and had a fresh one. We can see here that the age brackets are slightly different. So we've got 18 to 34. Previously we had, well, this is gonna be under 35, that's the same. But uh, 35 to 38 kind of envelops some of both of these. Yep. If you are comparing across these different sites, you need to have like have an eye for what their age brackets are because they're not necessarily consistent. But you can also see that you get the difference here because this is per fresh embryo transfer for age 18 to 34 has a 38.9% life birth rate, whereas per intended egg retrieval from SART had a 55% for that. But this was from intended egg retrieval, so is multiple, includes using frozen embryos, yada, yada, yada. Right. There are differences between these statistics that don't necessarily mean that the actual outcomes for this clinic aren't in line with the general population. Yep. This is one of the real difficulties about interpreting this stuff. Absolutely. The numbers can be so different. The actual statistics they cite can be very different, and it can be very hard to quite understand where you, as a person, fit into all of this mess. There's also a whole lot of other physiological or health things which are related to varying outcomes, including BMI, and we'll have an episode on BMI as a statistic at some point. Mm -hmm. For now, I will just say that I am pointing to a relationship which may or may not be directly causal, we don't actually know, but... Yeah, you know, there is a relationship there. Don't believe the things that cited as directly causal. They don't necessarily know that. Yeah. Even autoimmune disorders or things like that may affect outcomes. We don't know if long COVID affects these outcomes or other chronic illness or whatever. Yeah. There actually isn't a lot of data on social covariates. So like age, race, whatever. Well, no, we have yeah, age. age. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> that's, we don't have like race or class or that sort of thing. But given how expensive IVF is, it tends to be out of reach for a lot of poor people who tend to also have worth, worse health than the wealthy because they don't have access to good health care. Yeah. So while we don't really have good data for how that structure affects outcomes, we do know that poorer people tend to have worse health overall, so we can infer that chances are they would have poor outcomes from IVF. Absolutely. That's an inference. It's not a, a factual assertion. We need more data on that. Mm -hmm. Disability also has an impact on how people experience IVF, not just through the physiological aspect, but literally getting access as well. It may not surprise you to learn that people with disability, particularly congenital ones, get um, discouraged <laughs> from having kids and from accessing fertility support. This might be because the healthcare providers think that a person with disability 
shouldn't reproduce because they're eugenicist assholes, or will be unable to care for the child, which is generally a gross misrepresentation of what living with a disability is, or because the place where the treatment would take place is literally inaccessible to patients. Yeah. One account I read came from a blind person who had to use public transport to get to the clinic for treatment, which is a difficult and long process every day over the cycle of treatment, which was basically 10 consecutive days they had to go there. Right. Many clinics aren't even set up for people who use wheelchairs. It's every fucked barrier to getting access to healthcare in general applies doubly here because there aren't even kind of... Regulations. Well, yeah, or they're just not reflected very well. It sucks, frankly, and it could be done... It could be greatly improved on and should be greatly improved on. There's also fuck all data for how various disabilities affect IVF success because... In part, so few people with disabilities access that care and the variety of forms of disability is huge that you just don't necessarily have the data to know what that would cause. Mm -hmm. There is an added wrinkle for all of the above if you're a trans person, either AFAB and looking to become pregnant or AMAB and hoping to use your own sperm, or if you are intersex. We'll talk about intersex people first. For those who haven't encountered the term before, intersex people are born with variations in sex physiology. There's a huge variety of intersex physiology relating to reproductive structures and fertility, That the and the best that I could get from fertility clinic websites was a handful of questions about things like, what kit have you got? Do you have ovaries in the uterus? Do you produce sperm? That sort of thing. And a direction that they had staff who would be best able to tailor information in consultation. There's also pretty uniformly shit language across all of these with regards to any kind of diversity with gender. It sucks. People who have been subjected to surgical interventions as children uh, in order to make their physiology conform to a binary gender have additional barriers and all the trauma that goes along with those interventions. The complexity and variety of intersex experience means that there aren't really any population level statistics available for IVF treatments for intersex people, or at least none that I can find, and I imagine that a lot of what you get in a clinical setting is basically, well, we had these people who had experiences or physiology like yours, so this is kind of what they experienced. Yeah. In general, needs to be done better. Among trans people, there are more AFAB people than you might expect bearing children any given year. The data that I found was a few years old, but put that number in Australia at about 60. This isn't published much because, of course, the worst assholes on the planet sees on it as part of their transphobic campaigns. Not all of these people require IVF or similar to become pregnant, so there is pretty limited data available for the success rates of IVF for trans people. And often the estimates are for cis women with the caveat that it's unknown how these compare to the trans experience, which is kind of shitty. (laughs) Yeah, limited data makes it hard, and clinics may or may not be inclined to share their data with other clinics to give a broader overview. This is why I think, like, these sorts of broader industry level stuff is really useful, but is not tailored to uh, actual diverse experiences, let's say. My hope is that in the next few years that research becomes more available, and I think there's a push for it. For AMAB people, the typical mechanism is to store sperm and use it to fertilize eggs later, whether donor eggs or those of a partner. Sperm viability is affected by hormone treatment, so people who store sperm earlier are often more successful. And overall, the experience is much like situations with a cis male partner having difficulty producing viable sperm. I would also like to state that basically all of the websites relating to IVF are stupendously cis-normative and often heteronormative as well, and it fucking sucks. There's a lot of places in the world where that heteronormativity extends to the fact that you just can't access this care if you are in in a same-sex or even like a non-cis heterosexual relationship. Yeah. It sucks. Awful. Yeah. One last comment of this as a foreshadowing for the next episode is that many of the things we've talked about overlap, and you may see interactions between them. For example, if you're an older trans man, you may see an impact from your age, from being trans, and on top of that, some extra bit of variation that comes from being an older trans person, which is not seen in the different experiences of trans people and older people separately. What that means is that if you're trying to interpret something for your own experience, 
you may well have more uncertainty if there are multiple things going on that vary from the quote unquote typical experience of the predominantly cis, predominantly straight people doing this. And you're even less likely to get data if you have multiple overlapping things. Sorry, stats is hard and reporting of stats is bad. <laughs> the entire next episode will be about interactions between variables. Yeah. All right, that is us for today. But thank you so much again. Thanks ever for having me. Oh, 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 I almost forgot. Hang on, hang on. We have a Patreon. <laughs> Please give us money. We've had to pay for another year of hosting and it's expensive. Patreon.com slash statistically insignificant. And there are bonus episodes that will be available. All right, see you later. <laughs> Bye.